Part 9 of using Mathematica for ordinary differential equations. I've got two main goals for this video. One is to more carefully review what we've been doing recently with plotting graphs of solutions in slope fields, and also, as we did in the last video, graphing the right-hand side function for an autonomous differential equation and trying to understand something called the phase line for that type of situation. A little bit of terminology I'll introduce in this video, equilibrium points, sinks, and sources. And as we go, I also want to spend a little time talking about what you would call modularity in Mathematica programming. Actually, modularity is a concept that can come up in any kind of programming. It's a good idea. In a nutshell, you're taking a complicated program and you're trying to break it down into simpler pieces. It's got two main benefits as I see it. First of all, it can help make your program more understandable, both for you and for uh, readers, and help you find mistakes better. Secondly, it can also give you more flexibility, and I want to try to illustrate that with this example. It's the same example as in videos 5 and 8. Uh, we've got this fixed but arbitrary initial value problem here. It's an autonomous differential equation, dy dt, equals this expression, which doesn't have any t's in it. And that means the slope field is constant for constant values of y, constant along horizontal lines. You make the y-axis vertical in the slope field. y of 0 equals y sub 0 is your fixed but arbitrary initial condition, making this an initial value problem and making the solution, because this function is nice, unique. And I'm going to call the right-hand side here f of y. It's a function of y. And when I graph that function of y, I will make the y-axis horizontal, which is, again, different than what's in the slope field. Grid makes... Um, grids of graphs, for example. You can use it to make grids of graphs. And so we want to look at our solution curve in the slope field in the left side of the picture and make the graph of the right-hand side function in the right side of the picture. And in that case, again, the y-axis is horizontal. It becomes something called the phase line, and we'll talk about equilibrium points. We're going to modularize our code a bit, not as much as we could, to make it more understandable and more flexible. I should probably add that here, and more flexible so we can do more things with it. Again, I'm not going to do a full modularization. I'm just a partial one because we will have limited amount of times. There are going to be some, some technical issues and difficulties that come up actually in the code that I haven't talked about yet for this example. I did talk about it for other examples. I'm not going to take the time to fix those technical issues in this video, um, but I will show you where they come up. So here's the code we've been using recently. Here is f of y, the right-hand side function for the autonomous differential equation, y times 3 minus y over 4. Plot will plot that function. I can go ahead and enter this and see the plot of that right-hand side function again now with the y-axis horizontal. All right, first bit of modularization. We're going we're to want to use this graph down in our animation down here, right there. And one thing you can do to modularize is you can just rename it, give it a shorter name. You could call this f plot, like this. If I now enter this, I'm going to, with this f plot and equal sign, I'm going to store this graph in the variable I'm calling f plot. And to verify that that's now stored in there, I can type f plot like that and enter it, and there you go. The output is the graph. I can also clear f plot with clear, and once that's done, it turns blue again, and now nothing is stored in it. I'll go back up here and um, store the value again and do a bit of modularization down here. I'm going to replace this plot with that new variable name fplot. Oops, there's a mistake here. I forgot to store the pure function for the solution with dsol value into this variable. Let me go ahead and do that. Okay, ignore that error. It's not really a problem. And now I get the animation we saw at the end of the last video. And everything is fine. There's the solution curve in the slope field. And here's the graph of f of y. And the y-axis is going to be a call of the phase line. And I've got a dot there. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let me keep modularizing, though. Something else you want to, might want to do to not only make the code a little simpler. It's not much simpler, but it is a little simpler. You just have a smaller bit of code there to create that plot. That's how it's simpler. How about making it more flexible? Well, I could make f plot uh, over some other interval besides the interval from negative 1 to 4. And in fact, I could make the left and right endpoints of that interval animation parameters from my manipulate. I could call them, say, capital A and capital B. However, if I, however, if I do that here, if I make those capital A and capital B, I do need to specify then that f plot becomes a function of capital A and capital B like this. 
Now, unfortunately, if I try to enter this, there's going to be an, an error. Mathematica doesn't like it because I already have some of the graph stored in fplot. I think it should just overwrite what was stored in fplot if I enter this, but it is going to say failed. The reason for that is because I already have something stored in fplot. So now I will clear fplot and now re-enter this and now we don't get a failure, but we don't have any output. What's the problem? Well, the problem is I haven't specified what a and b are. I could certainly now specify some value for a and b like negative 1 and 4 and lo and behold I get a graph when I enter that. I could change the values of a and b to being negative 10 and 20 and I get a graph of the same function over a different interval. That's giving myself more flexibility. And so now down <clears throat> in the graph down here I need to put capital A and capital B in here like that, but now those are going to be animation parameters, so I also need to specify the ranges of values. For example, I could start A at negative 1, let it go down to negative 2 and up to 0, say. That's the syntax for that. I could let B start at 4, go down to 3 and up to 6 if I like. That will now make capital A and capital B also be animation parameters. You can see they popped up here in the sliders here. And now watch if I change them, the graph on the right will change the interval that I'm plotting it over. Okay, so that's giving myself more readability and more flexibility. Let's do one more bit of modularization. Let's also modularize the slope field. Let me take this code right here that creates the slope field, as I've described before, with vector plot. Cut it out. Uh, let's paste it here. And let's give this a name. How about slope field? And let's make this a function of a and b as well. Use the underscores and the colon equals. But if I'm going to do that, that's, those are endpoints for the y interval. That's going to be the second interval here, not the t interval. You want the y interval, so change the negative 4 and 4 here to a and b. And now if I want to use that, I go back down here and where I cut out the vector plot stuff before, I can put in the slope field a comma b, type it right, and now not only will the graph on the right change as I change capital A and capital B, but the slope field on the left will change as well. I can change in A and B, and you can see again the graph on the right changing, but also the slope field changing. So we are looking at this over different windows. Okay, that's giving you, uh, yourself again more flexibility and more readability because the code is smaller, you're seeing these, these functions that you've defined in here. If you understand what slope field and fplot do, you can understand this code better. All right, that's all the modularization I'm going to do for this video. Let's spend the rest of the time talking about this idea of this phase line and also some technical difficulties that come up with this code. Um, one thing I think I should probably do here, let me let B go forward in time. Um, which is the right endpoint, the little b here, of the interval that I'm plotting this over, is I think I should have made this red dot a blue dot. So let's go back up here. Graphics and point was what made this dot over here, and I made it red. I probably should have made it blue, and the reason is because the solution graph I made blue on the left. And there's a connection, a very intimate connection, between the solution graph on the left and the location of this blue dot on the right. What is that connection? Think about it for a second. The second coordinate of this point right here, which is its y coordinate, at the given value of little b, which again is the right endpoint of the interval that I'm plotting over, is the same as the first coordinate of this blue dot here. The y axis on the left is vertical, the y axis on the right is horizontal. But again, the y values, the second coordinate here and the first coordinate here, match. They're both in this case about two point uh, 2.65 or something like that. As I change the value of b, little b, the location of the dot on the right changes and the y coordinate of the solution curve as well as its t coordinate change. And watch how the value of y between these two graphs matches. Okay. Now if I change the y0, the initial condition here, Remember, if I let y0 go above 3, for example, the 
then the solution curve in the slope field becomes decreasing, and here's one of the technical difficulties. We've dealt with this kind of technical difficulty before, this vertical asymptote here, and this other piece of the graph that we kind of want to ignore. Uh, and it is fixable, but I don't want to take the time to fix it here. So that's one of the technical difficulties. Um, now let B increase in this case, and now instead of moving to the right, this blue dot moves to the left because this function is decreasing. Watch, here we go, I'm going to play it. Watch the blue dot on the right there is going to move to the left as little B increases, just barely. It heads toward 3, just like the graph on the left heads toward a horizontal asymptote at y equals 3. And so to finish the video here, what we've really got with this phase line idea, pause the animation here, please pause. There we go. Okay. Well, that's not pausing. Got to pause this one too. What we've got with this phase line idea, ignore that blue dot, this y axis, what you're doing is you're really focusing on the y value of the solution, and you're imagining, if you were drawing a phase line by hand at least, you're imagining time go by, and you're imagining the dot representing the y value as changing as time goes by. Now, there are two y locations where the dot would not move y equals 0 and y equals 3. The horizontal y axis intercepts in this graph would correspond to dots that don't move as time goes by. Those two equilibrium points correspond to the equilibrium solutions in the slope field. y equals 0 and y equals 3 were two horizontal lines, two constant functions that solve the autonomous differential equation. In this phase line thing, this phase line picture, you want to call those equilibrium points. They're points that don't move. This equilibrium point over here on the left at y equals 0 is called a source because if you start at a value of y that's not exactly equal to 0 but is close to 0, the point will move away as we saw the point that started right here and went to the right. It moved away as time increased. If we picked a starting value of y just to the left of the equilibrium point, it would move away as well to the left as time increased if we picked an initial value of y just barely less than zero. That's called a source and the equilibrium point over here at y equals three is called a sink because when you plug in initial values of y close to three but not equal to three they head towards three. So zero is an equilibrium point that's a source, three is an equilibrium point that's a sink. I'll let you spend time thinking about why that's the case based on the, the, the way the graph of f is, in particular the fact that it's negative here, then positive, then negative, and see if you can generalize that. We'll talk about more examples in other videos.